Eight years into a turbulent decade, civilization would erupt into its greatest turmoil. No, it was not 1968. The year was 1848. While France under King Louis Philippe was relatively prosperous and progressive, and the government was well run for the most part, the French were in a word, bored. The king was colorless, and the French still smarted from the humiliation of Napoleon's defeat. Three factions opposed Louis Philippe, the Liberals, the Bonapartists, and the Republicans. The Liberals wanted to extend the vote. The Bonapartists wanted Napoleon's heir to lead France to glory once again, and the Republicans, as always, wanted to end the monarchy. When the economy turned sour in 1846, Louis Philippe lost the primary basis of his support, a good economy. By 1847, the Liberals and the Republicans joined together. After demonstrations in Paris were attacked by the army, the only way to avoid massive bloodshed was for Louis Philippe to abdicate. The Second French Republic was quickly formed, but just as soon fell into class and ideological struggles. When the elections for the presidency were held on 10 December 1848, Louis Napoleon won with a surprising landslide victory, over 5 million votes, around 75% of the total. This was largely due to a conservative backlash against the radicals and the high name recognition of Bonaparte. Napoleon III, known as Louis Napoleon, prior to becoming emperor, was also the nephew of Napoleon Bonaparte by his brother Louis, who married Hortense de Beauharnais, the daughter by first marriage of Napoleon's wife Josephine de Beauharnais, thus making him both Napoleon's step-grandson and his nephew at the same time. Four years later, in 1852, when he proclaimed himself Napoleon III, history seemed ready to repeat itself. Austria had regained significant Italian territory with the defeat of Napoleon, but nationalism had been awakened in the Italians. They would struggle against Austria beyond this period into unification sometime later in the century. Events in Austria itself were touched off by the revolution in Paris. The Habsburg Empire was ripe for revolution. Its government was ineffective and corrupt, but more significantly, the empire was made up of many different nationalities. After news of the revolution in Paris, Vienna saw student protests and violence in the street. Prince Metternich was forced to resign, and an assembly of citizens in Vienna was elected a national assembly. From Vienna, revolution spread to other parts of the empire. There were uprisings in Lombardy and Venetia, as the Italian Risorgimento has already underway. A pan-Slavic Congress formed in Prague, but Austria's military governor crushed it with the bombardment of the city. In Hungary, the Austrian government agreed to the March Laws, which gave great autonomy to the Hungarians who went on to deny any such freedom to other groups, such as Croats, within their borders. Austria was thus able to play one group against another, and invaded Hungary with the backing of the Croats. While the various nationalities were being forced back into the empire, a second, more radical outbreak in Vienna was put down by Prince Felix Schwarzenberg. In 1849, he dissolved the National Assembly, imposed his own centralized constitution and forced Ferdinand I to resign in favor of Franz Joseph. Yes, that's the same Franz Joseph who would be still the Emperor of Austria-Hungary through the first half of World War I. Hungarian resistance was finally crushed with the help from Tsar Nicholas I of Russia. The Tsar did not want to see any of these revolutions spread to places he controlled, such as Poland. By mid-August of 1849, all of the forces of revolution in the Austrian Empire had been crushed.
as the forces of nationalism and liberalism tried to pull the Habsburg Empire apart, they so tried to pull the nation of Germany together. The formation of the Zollverein, a German customs union, had eased trade and commerce throughout Germany and foreshadowed unification. The first German uprising took place in Bavaria even before the events of Paris. After the news of Paris, the revolts became widespread across Germany. Outside of Austria, the most powerful German state was Prussia. When revolution came to Berlin, Frederick William was easily frightened into appointing a liberal ministry and agreeing to a constitutional assembly. When news reached Berlin that the Austrian government had been successful in cracking down against its own revolt, Frederick William dissolved the assembly and imposed his own constitution. The revolutionaries in Germany did not give up. Another assembly in Frankfurt, whose delegates had been elected by the people, was drafting a constitution for all of Germany. The Frankfurt Parliament elected Frederick William as Emperor of the Germans, but he refused a crown offered by the people. This combined with the successful Habsburg crackdown had all but finished the revolution in Germany. Many people had expected revolution to strike Britain first. The reality was just the opposite as other than a brief flare-up in Ireland, the British Isles remained peaceful with no barricades thrown up in the streets. Much of this was likely due to the many reform bills that were passed in the years preceding 1848. Free trade policies triumphed as the Corn Laws and other tariffs had been repealed. The Chartist movement called for wider suffrage and a major demonstration took place in London in 1848. The British government was ready with a significant security presence around the crowd. Recognizing that violence would only lead to disaster, the Chartist leaders called only for peaceful protest. As the weather turned to rain, the crowd peacefully dispersed. The truth is, with the repeal of the Corn Laws in 1846, much of the fire in the Chartist movement had already dissipated. 1848 was a year-long wave of revolutions that swept Europe. Among the major powers, only England and Russia were spared, although England came close to revolt. Generally, the revolutionaries were an attempt to undo the settlement of 1815. Nationalism was the primary concern of the revolutions in Central Europe. In Western Europe, nationalism was no longer an issue. There, the chief aim of the revolution was the extension of political power beyond the upper middle class. The weakness of the revolutionaries was due partly to a lack of well-defined programs, or else the existence of too many different programs and in the indecision of their leaders. Not only was there disunity among the revolutionary forces within each country, there was no attempt to coordinate the different revolutions. Two forces did emerge from the turbulence of 1848 that would in time come to dominate Europe, nationalism and socialism. The explosive mixture of these elements would see Europe face its most devastating war in history just under a hundred years later. Thank you.